On this episode of Pilot's Discretion, we're joined by airshow pilot and flight instructor Spencer Suderman. He talks about setting a Guinness World Record for inverted flat spins, losing a prop in flight, and what airmanship means to him. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, John Zimmerman of Sporties. A reminder to visit sporties.com slash podcast for all of today's show links and for access to every episode of Pilot's Discretion. You can also email us at podcast at sporties.com if you have comments or guest ideas. Today, it's great to have Spencer Suderman on the podcast. He is a man of many talents, but not many fears. In 2016, he added his name to the Guinness Book of World Records by completing almost 100 inverted flat spins. He's also an airshow performer and an active flight instructor specializing in tailwheel and aerobatic instruction. Spencer, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Well, thank you so much. I'm really glad you invited me to be here. Thank you. So we've got to start with the record-setting flight. 98 inverted flat spins from 24,000 feet in a pits. Take us inside the airplane during that. What does it feel like as you're spiraling down there? Well... I don't know. I had my eyes closed, so I wouldn't see anything bad happen. So <laughs> can't really tell you. I didn't see much. Uh, no, all kidding aside. So it, it's an interesting experience. If you've ever flown inverted in an airplane, most people who've done or tried aerobatics or upset recovery training have done a very small amount and short period of inverted flight. Well, as uncomfortable as that may be for some, the feeling of hanging from your seatbelt, the blood going to your head, think of when you were a kid and you, you know, played on the monkey bars and hung upside down for a while and the blood goes to your head. Um, imagine doing that for three minutes, except for those over three minutes. It's not just upside down, it's actually a higher amount of negative G. So when you're just upside down, that's negative one G, right? Just as we sit here, it's plus one G. Well from the spinning of the airplane, it's about three quarters of a G higher because you've got the upside down of hanging upside down and you've got the spinning of the airplane creating some transverse G. So uh, bottom line is it's super uncomfortable. It's almost a little painful. Uh, the blood is pooling in your head. It feels like your eyeballs want to blow out of your skull. Imagine the worst congested head cold you've ever had. Multiply that by two, maybe three, maybe six. I don't know. But um, it's, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. Plus, you're trying to manage the airplane. It, you're not just sitting there. You're not a passenger. You've got to hold the right rudder in. You've got to hold the stick in the right corner. You've got to make sure the throttle stays wide open. You've got to be monitoring your engine, you're looking at oil pressure, oil temperature, exhaust gas temperature. You're pretty lean when you start at those altitudes. You've got to constantly adjust your mixture as you're descending, which is quite rapid. It's up to 10,000 feet a minute when the spin starts for about the first half of it. So there's a lot going on physically and mentally. Um, it's a little bit of a workout. And, and people say, well, you're just sitting there upside down. Right, but the brain's working hard. The fingers and hands and feet, a little bit working. Plus, imagine trying to step on the rudder pedal for three minutes straight. You got to do plenty of squats, do a lot of bike riding to kind of you know condition myself for that. There, there is some physical activity involved, although it's uh, what they would call isometric, meaning you're pushing against an immovable object. Well, do that for three minutes with your feet. So uh, I don't recommend it for most people. <laughs> Good advice. This may be an obvious question, but are you disoriented during this? Or do you, do you have some, once you settle in, do you have some sense of sort of where you are? Um, I, I didn't notice being disoriented during the spin. I've done this a few times now. <laughs> Uh, I, I've attempted to set, I've set, broken this record twice. Um, each attempt took three, three tries till I did it. So I've, I've, I've done these longer spins, you know, I've, plus, you know, the third attempt at breaking this, I've got two of those under my belt. So I've done this at least, what, eight times. There's not a lot of disorientation once you're inverted, the spin starts, you're going. It's when you recover. So all that blood that was up in your head, now you roll the plane over, you've got to be gentle on the pullout so you don't, um, you know, take a little nap when you don't want to at a low altitude. That's when the disorientation comes. So now all this blood that was up in your head has to go back around the rest of your body. You feel a little bit disorientated um, for a short period of time after you uh, recover to straighten level and you're trying to get your bearings and ability to, you know, be in control of the airplane back. My technique has been recover, get to level flight, then immediately put the airplane in a climb and pick up a few thousand more feet of altitude for safety. 
not that I want to do this, but how would I get in an inverted flat spin in a Cessna 172 or Piper Cherokee? Is it possible? So, you know, that's a great question. Um, I actually discuss this with students when we do upset recovery training. The number one thing you need is to have the yoke or stick all the way forward. Even if you start from upright, if you push all the way forward, you're eventually going to end up inverted. So I always ask pilots the question, when would you ever push your yoke or stick, other than a specific aerobatic maneuver, such as an inverted spin, when would you ever push the flight control all the way forward? And normally the answer is you wouldn't. So the, the possibility of getting into an accidental inverted spin in a normal GA airplane, I, I would say is as close to 100% impossible as you're going to get. Plus, you know, the typical Piper or Cessna doesn't have any inverted fuel or oil systems. So, right, and, and most Cessnas and Pipers have a carbureted engine. As soon as you turn it upside down, the carburetor float is going to go the other way and the engine's going to quit. So, uh, there's so many things working against you to even allow you to do this on purpose, much less by accident in a non aerobatic airplane. So, let's pull out a little bit from the extreme of an inverted flat spin to the broader concept here. And you and I have worked a little bit recently on a new video series, which we'll link to here in the show notes, focusing on basic pilot skills. And this has been an interesting process for me because there's a lot of talk these days about upset prevention recovery, you know, UPRT courses, but I've really enjoyed your approach, which is not a maybe a technical UPRT approach, but more just a basic focus on airmanship. So what do you think that word airmanship means? Um, airmanship to me is a pilot's ability to be in command of the airplane. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. I, when I teach, I try to get across the idea that pilots communicate with the airplane through the flight controls, through the yoke, the stick, rudder pedals, the engine instruments, like the throttle, the mixture, the prop control. It's a language that you learn to speak to the machine when you're learning how to fly. And things happen in airplanes that pilots think are happening to them when in fact they are, in, they are commanding the airplane inadvertently, as I like to say. So if you think of the classic um, base to final stall spin accident, it still happens today. You know, it's funny, uh, we, man has been flying for over 100 years. I, I don't think anyone's invented a new way to crash lately. People keep doing the same things over and over, which tells you something. It tells you that people are not understanding how to talk to the airplane. There's a communication barrier. They don't understand that an airplane, especially a normal certified GA airplane, only does what the pilot tells it to do. So you have to understand, you have to notice how to speak the language and communicate eloquently and with, with determination and purpose to the airplane. So. To get back to the question you asked, you asked me what airmanship means. Airmanship is the ability to have command of the language of aviation and communicate with your airplane so that it does what you tell it to do. You are, in, you, you, you are commanding the airplane. You are not along for the ride. If you're along for the ride, then you are not exhibiting um, good airmanship or possibly any airmanship. That's a great way to put it. I, I love the concept of speaking to the airplane and knowing how to speak the language. So if I'm focused on improving that, what's the most underrated skill there within that broader airmanship framework? What's something that most pilots should be working on more? So understanding how, how an airplane turns, it's the most basic thing. Um, I always start my upset prevention recovery training class with a student by asking them the very simple question, which flight control makes the airplane turn? And it's amazing, there's, there's three, three opportunities to get it right. And I would say more than 80% get it wrong. Well, the answer is it's the elevator. The elevator makes the airplane turn. So a lot of pilots are lulled into thinking it's the ailerons because that's what banks the airplane. But simply banking the airplane doesn't turn it, it simply banks the airplane. And the way to evaluate that is when you're in a turn, Look down at the wing. By the way, how often do you look down at the wing when you're flying? And most pilots I find, I ask that question, they go, look at the wing. Well, I'm looking where I'm going or right. Well, look around, you know, you got all those windows, enjoy the view a little bit. But if you ever look at the wing when you're in a turn, say a normal private pilot turn of maybe 30 degrees or a private pilot steep turn of 45 degrees, establish the bank 
get in the turn and look at the ailerons. What are they doing? Well, they're neutral. Because after you've established the bank, you neutralize them. Whether you realize it or not with the yoke, if you don't neutralize it, the plane will continue to roll, right? All the way around if you let it. So the next one people come up with is the rudder. That's usually the guess. They go, well, rudder. And it's funny when they say, like a boat. Some, some actually will say, well, it's the rudder, like a boat. That's, that's a much longer discussion to you know, fix that line of thinking because there's so many, so many things different between an airplane and a boat and how the rudder works and what it does. And a few will say the elevator and then I'll say, and, and they don't always know why that's the right answer. And you have to explain it that really, what is the elevator control? Well, the elevator simply controls the angle of attack of the wing, right? It controls the pitch, controls the airplane about that axis. Whether the airplane is straight and level well, I think we all understand that if you're flying straight and level and you pull back on your yoke or your stick, the airplane's nose goes up and you climb, you're affecting the angle of attack of the wing. It's no different when you're in a turn, right? 100% no different. The, the reason people get confused, I think, is we're taught as pilots, as private pilots, to do these beautiful, smooth, blended turns where we smoothly roll in. All at the same time, we roll in the bank, we apply the um, rudder to counter the adverse yaw from the ailerons and we apply some back pressure. So it's a little confusing to people which flight control turns the airplane. When we do upset recovery training and we focus initially on the airmanship, we isolate the flight controls, meaning we focus on each one individually and what they do. And usually that helps people understand it much better. Do you have a favorite exercise for somebody who wants to improve their stick and rudder skills, something they should they can go out and do on their own pretty easily. So, well, it, isn't it funny you should ask that question because it's, uh, I believe that's coming out here in episode four of the, um, the series and that's called Shapes in the Sky. And Shapes in the Sky is a fun thing I like to do with people where I tell them to draw geometric shapes with the nose of the airplane. So I usually start with something simple like a square where if imagine the airplane at the lower, as you sit in the pilot seat, the lower left corner of the square. So you pull the nose up. Well, that's easy. You just pull the yoke back. Now you um, bring the nose to the right. And the rule is you have to keep the wings level. And by keeping the wings level while you are yawing to the right, you have to put in left aileron. So really you're slipping the airplane at that point. So without even telling people we're going to learn about slips, guess what? They're learning about slips because they're focused on making that geometric shape in the sky. And it, it after the square, I then like to do the triangle because that's a little more challenging because now you're moving the nose in two direct, not just straight up and not just straight horizontal. It's got to go vertical and horizontal at the same time. Really a little more challenging. Still got to keep the wings level. Really have to focus on the rudder work to make this uh, maneuver work. And again, it's a slip because when you start off and you move to the upper right to get to the peak of the triangle, you're using a bunch of left rudder. Again, teaching slips without even telling them they're learning slips. Then you got to push it down. And also you'll notice the gyroscopic effects of the propeller by pushing and pulling on the uh, yoke. And then the hard one's a circle. Absolutely my favorite part, making them do a complete circle because you have to go not just um, diagonally, but you have to focus on actually making the round shape. And you got to remember to finish below where you started, bring the nose all the way down below that altitude and back up. Um, and the, the G's you feel, this is no more G's than maybe a private pilot steep turn, maybe a G, G and a half, really gets people focused on manipulating with the plane with their feet and their hands and understanding um, how the controls work with each other and getting them more in the mindset of what airmanship and command of the airplane is all about. That, that's, a, that's a, I can't wait till that episode comes out because that's going to be a really fun one. I think we'll get a lot of comments on that. Yeah, it's a great one for folks who have never tried it. The drawing a circle in the sky sounds simple, but it is really challenging. It, it is a great mental and physical exercise for all parts of, of the pilot. Indeed. Spencer, I want to zoom out to another uh, interesting flight you had, uh, which was in 2019, a, a rather hair raising experience. I think you'd probably agree. Uh, you were flying a pits and lost its propeller mid flight. And lots of things I'm curious about there, but one of them is the startle response, a, a topic that's gotten some attention from FAA even lately. And I'm wondering in that moment when this happens, 
was there a moment when you were just sort of in shock before you reacted or did the instincts and the training kick right in? So that's a good question. Um, I do a lot of practicing emergency procedures in my plane. So the nature of the flying I do, not just aerobatics, but also I've done air shows. Um, you're always thinking, what is the out of a maneuver? And, and keep in mind, when you're doing air shows, you're doing things very close to the ground. You're always gotta be thinking, what is the out for this maneuver? So the longer you do that for, and you're always thinking and practicing the out, because I would practice the out, well, in a pits, well, any airplane. If you're climbing, and you lose an engine, you immediately push the nose down. And you know you might get away with it for a little longer in a Cessna, but in something like a pits, when you're climbing at say 80, 90, 100 miles an hour, you're not that far above stall speed. If, and they have a lot of power. So you tend to climb at very aggressive angles and really enjoy the use of that power, but they also drop like rocks out of the sky. So you wanna get away from the ground as quickly as possible and give yourself the opportunity to recover from an emergency should you have one. So I'm, I'm almost spring-loaded that if I lose power, I push the nose down. Well, this was one of those cases. Um, I, I had a, something was wrong. There was vibration in the airplane. It was RPM related, and I was just about to get off my flight path and divert to Van Nuys Airport. I was flying over the San Fernando Valley, if people are familiar with the, the valley, where the valley girls come from. Um, right near me was Van Nuys. I was very close to Whiteman Airport, and Burbank was a little further away. So this vibration was becoming more persistent. Rather than push on, I was just about to key the mic and tell SoCal Approach that I was gonna to divert to Van Nuys. A, a moment before I pushed the mic to tell him that the prop, it just tink, literally went, I heard a tink was the prop hitting the airplane and I knew it was gone. I, I just knew right away. I pulled the throttle all the way out. Not that it mattered much, um, but I pulled the throttle all the way back to keep the engine from racing and I immediately pushed the nose down. Now I was cruising, so I was going about, I think if I looked at my, if I recall from the GPS output, I was going about 154, 155 miles an hour. Um, but I immediately pushed the nose down. And I knew the airport was about two miles off my left. And I was at 7,500 feet. And the field elevation there at Whiteman, I think is 102, 100, or I'm sorry, 1,002 or 1,004 feet. And I'm familiar with that airport. I used to teach there and flew there years before. So I immediately um, pushed the nose down. I didn't aim right for the airport. I aimed about a mile off the approach end of runway one, two, which is the normal direction in that airport with normal wind, knowing that if I'm over the airport and, you know, I get my, and, and remember a pits drops like a rock. Although I will say they glide better without the prop than they do with the prop. So <laughs> if anyone has that question about, you know, pits gliding, definitely better without the prop where you take that piece of drag away. Um, I aimed off the end of the runway. I, so I did, I did the three basic things. I aviated, right? I flew the airplane. I navigated towards where I wanted to get set up for my emergency landing, and then I keyed the mic, and there's a recording online. It's still there. I think it's linked off of some various stories that are out there. But I just very, and it was calm, and I can say it because it's recorded, and everyone can hear it if they want. And I just called up SoCal Approach and told them I had an emergency, and my prop departed, and I was gonna land at Whiteman, and what were the winds? Because I wanted to make sure if I lined up on runway one, two, that would indeed be the right one, runway. I was also very lucky because it was um, a morning where there had been a marine layer, which is very common in the Southern California area. I had been waiting at Santa Paula for the marine layer to clear to take off. So not a lot of airplanes were in the sky yet, you know, chasing $100 hamburgers that day. So luckily the airport at uh, Whiteman was not busy and I did, they didn't have to clear anybody out of my way. So here's the key take, and I did land successfully. I managed my energy, my altitude, my airspeed, and I was able to land and safely get off the runway at Whiteman. Um, couple things I, I would I recommend to people. Number one, fly as high as you can. Now I knew that airplane, it was a, it's a very extreme experimental airplane. And I knew that something could go wrong at any moment. So I wanted altitude. And now, you know, in retrospect, maybe 7,500 feet wasn't enough. Maybe 9,500 would have been better. More is better. Have, have plenty of altitude. Um, always be talking to flight following. Um, because of the nature of that airplane and the, you know, there's no room in it. If you've ever been in a one seat pits, they're small. There's no room for charts. I didn't have any charts. I, you know, you, you can't fumble around on the, I do have a GPS. Good luck trying to fumble around looking for a frequency in an emergency. You should be already beyond frequency with flight following. So if an emergency happens, you just key the mic and talk. And I did. So um, I was prepared in all the ways I could be. And I had also flight planned to fly over as many airports as possible just in case. Well, all the just in cases kind of came to fruition that day and my, my planning paid off. 
So when I talk to pilots and they talk, I, I, I ask people when I do flight reviews, do you always talk to flight following when you do a, a, a long cross country? I'd say half say, no, once I'm out of the busy airport area, you know, I like the quietness. I turn down, I go like, you should talk to them. Number one, you get traffic alerts. Number two, if you have an emergency, you're already on the frequency. You don't have to fumble around. Once you've gone 30, 40 miles, you're not even sure what frequency you should call them on. So just stay on the frequency. Just talk to them the whole time. And I'm talking from experience here. Had I not been, to, I was on the ground a little over two minutes after the prop came off the airplane. I had no time to fumble and I thought I had a fire. And at one point I had to push the nose down even more to try to blow the fire out. And I did think about bailing for a moment, but I was over a fairly populated area. So managing the emergency was top of mind. Um, all these other things would have been distractions that may have prevented a positive outcome from that emergency. Great lessons learned, unbelievable. Spencer, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with some more questions in just a minute. Take your flying skills to the next level with Sporty's Tailwheel Checkout Course. Over two hours of 4K video help you master these demanding airplanes and explore the huge variety of tailwheel operations, from Piper Cubs on grass strips to turbine otters on glaciers. Earning a tailwheel endorsement can open up an exciting world of flying adventures, including light sport aircraft, high performance experimental aircraft, and backcountry flying. This course, hosted by legendary airshow pilot Patty Wagstaff, is the perfect introduction. Visit sporties.com slash tailwheel to learn more. Now, back to pilot's discretion. Spencer, let's talk about air shows because you've done a lot of air show flying. And I want to ask a slightly strange question here. We had Patty Wagstaff on last year who clearly knows how to fly an air show. She's amazing, but it almost seems like Patty Wagstaff was born flying air shows. So from somebody who's not Patty Wagstaff, can a normal person do it? If I wanted to go fly air shows tomorrow, you know, is there a path for me learning how to do it? Or do you have to be uh, a god to, to go upside down at 200 feet? Here's what I tell everybody who asks, you know, how do you become an, it's the how do you become an air show pilot question. I have, ne well, I've heard people say things like you say about Patty. Well, it seems like she was a born pilot. She was born an air show pilot. Nobody was born knowing how to fly an airplane. I mean, airplanes have only existed for, you know, just over a hundred years. Anybody can learn to be a pilot. Well, just about anybody. Um, I've actually met a few people who probably should go take up golf, but you know, that's, a, <laughs> maybe that's a story for another time. Anybody can learn to be a pilot. Anybody can learn to be an air show pilot. It's a learned skill. There is nothing that intuitive about it. It's, it's about learning a skill and applying it in the management of a, of a, you know, purpose-built airplane. Now I've had people say some interesting things to me like, oh, well, the things you do in an airplane, you can do because they're aerobatic airplanes and they don't apply to Cessnas. That's nonsense. Uh, there's, there's, you know, from a basic aero, aero, from a basic aerodynamic standpoint, a Cessna is no different than, than a Pitts or, or an extra 300. They have wings, they have ailerons, an elevator, rudder, and an engine. And they all do the same things from a basic sense. And the, the principles all apply. Um, and anybody who can learn to fly a Cessna can improve their skills and be trained to fly a more, um, so uh, let, let's say a more, a more exciting aerobatic airplane and learn how to manage that airplane. Will it happen overnight? No, it'll take a long time. It takes a long time to build those skills, to build up your ability to uh, fly you know, closer and closer to the ground and do it safely. And it's not just a physically manipulating the airplane set of skills, it's also the mental discipline, which is probably the more important skill than the um, ability to simply manipulate the airplane. What's your advice for somebody who's just afraid of it? You know, they, they're interested, but they're afraid to go upside down or they did a spin once and it terrified them. What do you tell them? Get with, well, there's no substitute for going out and doing it. Break the fear. Get in an airplane with a qualified instructor and you don't need to get in an extra 300. There's certainly enough flight schools that have, you know, one of the most common aerobatic trainers, the, the Super Decathlon. Get with a qualified instructor and let them ease you into it. Um, let them ease you into learning to roll the airplane. You can do many maneuvers with very low amounts of G. In fact, we teach it that way. 
in the program at Patty Wagstaff School that I teach. Uh, our first two lessons, we don't exceed typically two and a half G's positive, and we usually don't get lower than zero G's, or usually it's about a half a G. And we do rolls, we do spins, we do all kinds of uh, stalls, all kinds of basic maneuvers, and we ease people into it. If you've been scared by an instructor who maybe was not as proficient at spins as they should be, um, that's unfortunate. But you know, go find somebody, come to our school. There's, there's quite a few schools out there that have very qualified instructors in the right airplanes that can introduce you to it the right way. And that's important. I want to ask about your grandfather who flew B-17s in World War II, as I understand it. True. And I'm fascinated by that generation, obviously, and, and the legacy that that left for so much of us in general aviation. But I always like to think about what we could learn from them. So what do you think we as modern pilots could learn from that generation of pilots? So that's a really interesting question. Um, my grandfather, after World War II, did not continue flying, like a lot of people. He was actually in the jewelry business. He um, he heard the call to defend the country, to to you know, defend the world from tyranny and slavery and all the, th the things that were going on. And, and he answered the call and he felt like he went and did his duty, as did many people of that era. And I, you know, remember growing up, meeting a lot of his friends, some that he had served with. It, it was a very different mindset than I think a lot of people have now. So he came back from the war, just had no interest in flying, went back into the jewelry business and, you know, spent his life um, as a business person. When I started flying lessons in the 80s, I was in college, one of the things he asked me was about spin training. And that was important in, in World War II when they were training pilots, there was a heavy focus on spin training. And I told him, you know, they don't do that. Uh, that's not part of the uh, training curriculum. And he said, well, he, he certainly had his opinion about that. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure you can guess what it was, that spin training should be done. Um, uh, you know, ultimately I did get spin training it wasn't until a few years after I started flying and I saw, understood the value of going and take a spin training course, an unusual attitude course, which is kind of what got me started in the whole aerobatic, I, I call it lifestyle or habit or addiction, however you want to look at it. But that was a different generation. And they thought about things, they were very pragmatic, I think, in needing to do what needed to be done and then moving on. All right, Spencer, at the end of each one of these episodes, we always close with some rapid fire questions in a segment we call Ready to Copy. So I'll throw out some questions. You give me your quick answer. Are you ready to copy? I'm ready. Ready to copy. Better aerobatic airplane, pits or extra? Better for what? Depends on what you're doing with it. They're both great, but they have slightly different missions these days. You get tossed the keys to either one. Which one are you going in? I really like the pits. I just, I'm just fond of the pits. What's your favorite aerobatic maneuver? Of course, that would be the inverted flat spin. And why? Not because I've broken the record twice. Uh, it just sounds so just gnarly and can I say badass? Absolutely. Um, okay, it just sounds, and you know, people always ask, well, why, why wouldn't you do a world record for upright flat spins? No one has that record. I said, because it doesn't sound as badass as an inverted <laughs> flat spin. And besides, somebody had that record and I needed to break it. <laughs> Very good answer. Tell me your uh, quickly your tip on uh, using trim in an engine failure situation. So in most general aviation airplanes, as particularly Cessnas, if you trim full nose up, you turn that wheel all the way down, you will get yourself very quickly to just about 65 knots. And let's uh, not confuse full nose up trim with full elevator up. The trim tab cannot make the elevator go full up, so that won't stall the airplane. So I actually teach that procedure. Just get that nozzle wheel all the way down, um, let the airplane, it'll oscillate a bit. It'll settle in at the, at the right airspeed. You focus on some of your other engine out tasks. You can always revisit the trim if it's, you know, 62 knots or 67 knots, but it'll get you close like right now. And it's a great technique. Is it okay for me to bank an airplane more than 30 degrees in the traffic pattern? Well, gosh, I hope you do if you need to. Uh, that is another fallacy we keep hearing. You certainly can. I would try to keep it, you know, or, or for most pilots, keep it under maybe 40 or 50 bank is necessary. And of course, stay coordinated with the rudder. We don't want to be skidding the airplane in the pattern when we're already slow and low. But um, there should be no fear of banking more than 30. There's no rule against it. There's no law against it. And people who commonly say, well, you, you know, you're going to overload the airplane and stall it. 
Well, you're only loading up the wing if you're banking and holding altitude, right? In the pattern, especially based to final turn, you should be descending. So banking at 40 or 50 degrees shouldn't put any more load on the wing than banking at uh, you know, 10 or 20 or 30, as long as you're descending like you're supposed to be. So I'm all in favor of it, but it needs to be done properly, coordinated, and you know, with, from, from a place of experience and practice. You spend a lot of time shooting video in airplanes. So what's your best quick tip for shooting better aviation videos in the cramped environment of a general aviation cockpit? So uh, that's a, wow, that's a good question. Um, the more cameras, the better. <laughs> Get, so in all serious, multiple angles. It, it's nice to have a camera uh, on, on yourself and capture your reaction to things. It's nice to point one out the window and let people see. Try to use wider angles, wide angle as possible. If you're using GoPros, um, I only use super view mode if the camera is, you know, like right in my face and I need to get my whole self and otherwise I tend to use the wide mode so you don't get all that distortion. Um, it's a little challenging in Cessna's because it's dark in the cockpit, somewhat dark and bright outside and that can wreak havoc on cameras with, you know, the high contrast. Took me a while actually, you know, to get back into, well, when I started doing the series for sporties to figure out how to shoot in Cessnas, I'm so used to aerobatic planes with their bubble canopies and lights not an issue. It's just real easy. So I had to uh, actually go through a little bit of a learning curve to get it right again. Trial and error is good, but um, look, look at what people are doing, see what works and what looks good, then try to figure out where their cameras are located and put the cameras in the same spots. Maybe that's the best tip. Yeah, I think that is a great tip. It, uh, like most things, a little more effort thinking through the setup is maybe worth more than the fancy footwork once you're in the airplane. I, I would agree. You work in IT when you're not flying upside down in flat spins. Are there habits from the world of technology that might make us safer pilots that we could steal? You know, that's an interesting question. I, I would say I became successful breaking world records because of my IT skill sets and understanding of how data collection and data manipulation and, and reading data or using data as a tool. There, there's some videos out there on YouTube you can find of how I broke, you know, how I collected data. I'm almost like a fiend with collecting data and doing experiments in airplanes with different settings. What IT taught me is the value of data to inform your decisions or pivot your strategy. Um, I, I, you know, and that may be hard for people who aren't in IT to understand, but if you understand the value of data and what it tells you, it can inform your flying. And really what's flying all about these days, it's about data points, airspeed, altitudes, bank angles, distances, wind vectors. There's actually a lot of data involved you don't realize. And understanding how to use it and harness it is a really powerful part of becoming a pilot, I think. All right, Spencer, our last question is always the same on pilot's discretion. You have one final flight. We want to know what are you flying and where are you going? I'm flying in my pits and I'm going a few miles from the airport and I'm going to run through all my favorite aerobatic maneuvers, maybe an air show routine because nothing gives me more joy than just flipping around in the sky in a pit special. Spencer, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporties Pilot Shop. For more episodes and links to additional information, visit sporties.com slash podcast. And if you have comments or guest ideas, email podcast at sporties.com. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion. Pilot's Discretion.